In John 3, 5, Jesus says you must be born of water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this is easily one of the most controversial passages in the New Testament. But what does Jesus really mean here? And is water baptism even relevant to this conversation? To really understand what he's saying, we need to know how this connects to the Passover holiday and the story of the bronze serpent in the wilderness in the book of Numbers. When you understand what Jesus is really telling Nicodemus here, you'll see why water baptism is irrelevant to this conversation. So let's jump into John chapter 3 to see why Jesus compares himself to, of all things, things, a bronze serpent in the wilderness. We're in John chapter 3 this morning. This is officially, I don't know, episode 4 or 5 in this series on the Gospel of John. The last thing we talked about was Jesus knowing what's in all people and, and turning water into wine and cleansing the temple. And if you didn't watch that, go watch that um, message. I enjoyed it greatly as the Lord revealed a lot to me. I'm just going to read John chapter 2 and 3. We're going to break this down. Here's kind of the outline of where we're going today. I know that a lot of people want to make John chapter 3 a conversation on water baptism. We want to get to the heart. If you want to know my thoughts and my personal theology and understanding of what scripture says about water baptism, I have videos on that. And moderators, if you would like to link that, please do just ahead of time. You can even pin it if you have the authority to do that. Um, but I just don't want this to be a conversation on just that. This is a great, so much deeper. This is a, a, a much bigger conversation, not to minimize the significance um, of water baptism within the framework of faith. And I know that there's different ways to explain um, how water baptism fits within the framework of faith and following Jesus and trusting in him and having loyalty to him. I understand there's different perspectives and I, I, I can see how people conclude what they do. But this is not, if you came here for a conversation on water baptism, you ain't going to get it. Um, what you're going to get is... I guess, a deeper understanding of what Jesus is really saying to Nicodemus and how it relates to our faith and how that impacts us as people to live for God in this broken world full of darkness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read John chapter 3. Um, we're going to look at what Passover is, uh, the significance of the firstborn and, and the womb relating to Passover. We're going to look at the born-again language Jesus uses and how water is associated with Passover and, and the Red Sea crossing. And then we're going to look at why Jesus references the bronze serpent narrative in Numbers. Jesus references this small story, which is about eight verses of Israel's rebellion, brought, uh, serpents come and bite them, inflict death and pain, and people are dying all over the place, and God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent. There's a reason that Jesus brings this in. Besides the general, God sent his son into the world so that all who look to him might be saved. That is the macro picture, for sure. Um, and that is the general statement Jesus is making. But when we actually connect br the bronze serpent narrative to Passover and all that Jesus is saying, the language he's using, and if we just remove our assumptions, our, our presuppositions, our biases from the text, we can actually read it for what it's saying. Um, and then we're going to look at the similar elements in both stories. And I think where you see the bronze serpent narrative and the Red Sea crossing Passover story crossover, where you see them overlap you will see the beauty of G what Jesus is saying in John 3. Um, and then we can break down what it means to see the kingdom of God and, and being born again and being born of water and entering the kingdom and, and all these different things. But first we need the background information. So John chapter 2, just to back it up, verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. And I want you to do your best as I read this to be mindful of the Passover. Be mindful of all that led up to the Passover, just as the last chapter has incredible significance to, as it relates to the Passover. Be considering how this story also relates to Passover and the plagues or wonders uh, that come prior to that and the Red Sea crossing and all these different things. Look for that language. Look for those ideas. Uh, but Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need anyone to bear witness about man. He knew what was in man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. And I think it's very important that we understand who it is that Jesus is about to have this private nighttime conversation with. And a lot of people want to chalk this up to secrecy. Um, I don't know that we can assume He's coming in the way he is because of secrecy and he wants to remain uh, hidden from the rest of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. But Nicodemus is a Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, and part of the Sanhedrin. Um, and so this man has prominent authority and standing and status in this, that society. Um, so he comes to Jesus by night, again be thinking Passover, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. 
Uh, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Think of Moses and the signs he does to Pharaoh. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, look, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Jesus just goes right for it. I'm not, I'm not beating around the bush. I know what you're here for. You can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus answered, look, Truly, truly, like, ver pay very close attention to what I'm about to tell you. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, and this is the most controversial section of this passage, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. See, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Look, the wind blows where it wishes. Right? You hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered them, look, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, here comes that bronze serpent story reference, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The whoever here might be um, what glues this whole section together, this whoever. I want us to pay very close attention to that simple yet extremely profound word, whoever. Because we look back at this passage in hindsight with all the knowledge and information that we have being in the 21st century with all the biblical, uh, you know, history that has transpired already in the early church and all the years. We have all this information going, yeah, Jew and Gentile, we get it. But man, this is a pretty profound statement for Jesus to make. So what we have to ask is if Passover... And the bronze serpent are the primary stories being referenced in John 3. We should probably think about where they overlap. That would be a, at least my, my initial suspicion would be, hmm, maybe these two stories are communicating the same point and they might overlap in different ways. And then that might inform how I properly understand this conversation if Jesus is referencing those two stories. So it would be in our best interest to have a, just at least a general understanding of the Passover. Leviticus chapter 23, the Lord says, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them, okay? There's three primary feasts in which the men of Israel primarily need to show up in Jerusalem before the Lord with sacrifice to feast and celebrate and recall God's faithfulness. Verse five, in the first month on the 14th day, okay, let's make sure we know what month, what day. This is the 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar at twilight, Okay, that is the Lord's Passover. So it's not just a month. It's not just a day. It's actually a time frame within that day. Of course, the feast and the preparation goes well beyond that time frame. But twilight, that, that, that section of the day is primarily dedicated to the celebration referred to as Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, to the Lord for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So right after, fall, the day after Passover has been celebrated, boom, the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins for a seven-day period, which begins on the 15th day. That's the feast, the festival of unleavened bread to the Lord. And you should already have made preparation to have cleansed your home of anything leavened, right? So now you only have unleavened bread for seven days. And on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work. Thank you, Chuck, for that gift. So listen... This is Passover, one of the three primary feasts that the Jewish men primarily need to show up to Jerusalem to celebrate. Exodus 12 gives us another, another different view of Passover, but within the context of the Exodus, okay? In other words, this is God instituting it as these things real time are happening. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So notice where God tells Moses uh, to institute Passover. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. 
it shall be the first month of the year for you. In other words, God is distinguishing his people and their calendar and the way they celebrate time and their holidays from the rest of the pagan world around them. He's setting them apart in a time frame kind of sense, in a Hebrew calendar kind of sense. Tell all the congregation of Israel this, that on the 10th day of this month, four days before Passover, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, he and his nearest neighbor, I love the communal aspect of this, he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now, we would love to read this passage with, um, I don't know, very narrow American lens, right? And just go, for those of us that are in America, me, I'm in America, that's my context. We'd love to read this through an individualistic American lens where it's me, I insert me into the text. This is about me personally. And while there is personal application, I would like to draw out the first personal application for us, which is actually communal. We need to learn how to relate to God and relate to time and relate to life and reality in communal ways and not just in very individualistic pocket ways where it's like me, my family, my name, my lineage, my personal problems. But we see these things in the, con look at the, the communal aspect of this. If your household is too small, find your nearest neighbor. Now it's, now it's a collective effort and y'all are going at this together. I love that. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. And some of you needed to hear that. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, then you shall keep it until the 14th day. So four days this lamb is kept of the month until you slay it, kill that thing at twilight, right? That is the Lord's Passover. Then take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts. Notice the way that Israel is functioning as priests collectively as the nation that they, they haven't yet become like a, a national entity until after they cross through the Red Sea technically this is the beginnings of that but notice how Israel as these people unto God they're functioning as priests this is fascinating to me they shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it uh, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water but roasted its head with its legs its inner parts okay and this is what God says in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. This is the whole reason all these different things are being put in place. Here's, here's why you're doing all of this. Number one, God says, because I commanded it. Number two, because I'm about to come through and strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal, on all the gods of Egypt. So notice, this is not just a plague against people who are rebelling against God in Egypt. This is not just a plague that involves their animals. This is a direct attack against their gods too. God is executing judgment against all these things. Now, when we get to John 3, and Nicodemus has all of this at the front of his mind, Passover and judgment and preservation and salvation, there, there's a sense in which Jesus, are you... Are you coming to bring judgment? And that's why he'll say in verse 15 and 16, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So look, he says, I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. They become, each individual Israelite household becomes a kind of Noah's Ark, right? Where the flood is coming, the, 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 the angel of death is coming through Egypt, right? It's a localized flood on this nation. And if you would like to be preserved, your house has to become its own tiny Noah's Ark. And the way that happens is by you obeying what God has said. Put the blood on the doorpost, sacrifice the lamb, feast unto the Lord, celebrate Passover, stay in your home. When the angel of the Lord, uh, technically the Lord too, angel of death comes through, when he sees the blood... But notice what God says. He takes his personal. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this becomes a repeating uh, statement God will make to Israel. Look, if you just obey me, the plagues I brought on them, the disease, the illness, the issues they dealt with, I won't bring that upon you. Just listen to what I'm saying. All right, so that's Passover. And now we have at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn. Just be very diligent to highlight what I'm highlighting if you can in your Bible, okay? I'm highlighting specific ideas that are going to link us right back to John 3. At midnight, 
the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, and it's speculated that Pharaoh, I, I never heard this before until like a couple days ago, that Pharaoh technically could have been a firstborn and he was preserved until the Red Sea took him. I don't know where the data comes for, from for that or what the evidence is for that claim. Um, but either way, the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, all the firstborn of the livestock, that's who the Lord struck down in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh rose up in the nighttime. Notice when all of this is taking place. And then think about when Nicodemus chooses to come to Jesus. And you can assume secrecy, you can assume privacy, you can assume a sense of fear. Um, I don't know if I would do that. But Pharaoh rises up, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. There was not a single house where someone was not dead. I want us to really think about that. There was not a single house within Egypt where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Go up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord. Go serve the Lord. Take your flocks, your herds, as you've said, be gone. And would you bless me also? Now that passing statement is pretty fascinating. You're like, why the heck would Moses choose to bless you, numbskull? <laughs> you, you have not been a friend to Israel. Um... But if you read the Jacob story, when he comes to Egypt, after Joseph kind of makes all this um, uh, preparation for them to come, uh, Jacob ends up blessing Pharaoh. So maybe that's what Pharaoh's referencing. To be clear, that was a different Pharaoh. So that's Passover. Now let us think about the significance of firstborn and the womb in Passover. And you go, why? That's weird. That's weird. Why are we doing that? Because... In John chapter 3, these will be the words, this is the setting, this is the context of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. But also, he will reference the womb. Uh, can I just climb into my, my mother's womb and be born again? I'm so confused, Nicodemus says. And then Jesus will talk about God sending his son. Sending his son. So there's a hinting at the firstborn and the womb. And both have significance in Passover. Exodus 12, 41 and 42 um, it says, at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went up from the land of Egypt. Now, that is interesting to me because he's referring to the nation of Israel. It was a night of watching by the Lord. So much. Of course, this is all taking place at night, but there's a lot of referencing to nighttime. To bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night, watch. This is what Passover is to function as, not in and of itself, but part of the way you view Passover as one of God's people in Israel is this night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people. In other words, because that was a night of watching by the Lord, the people also engage in that on that night as well. It's a night of watching to the Lord where the people are watchful and vigilant and considerate and meditating on the faithfulness and goodness of God and, and expecting something from him when it comes to God moving in his people. Okay, So this is a night of watching to be kept. Now let me take you to Exodus 13. The Lord said to Moses, this is right after God brings them out. This say, this is, it's still like technically happening real time. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever it is the first to open the womb, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast, is mine. Okay? It's mine, the Lord says. And then the firstborn was struck down in Egypt but the firstborn of Israel are dedicated to the Lord. Verse 11 through 16, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites that he set apart for your fathers, uh, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. So when we get to John 3 and there's this all this talk around womb and being born and children and firstborn, you got to be tracking with what Jesus is really talking about. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey, 
you shall redeem with a lamb. There's instruction about every firstborn of man among your sons shall be redeemed, right? So there's redemption language. God is preserving you guys. You're dedicating the firstborn of man to God. It's a redemption kind of transaction. And when it in time to when when it time in time to come, your son asks you, Oh, what does this mean, Dad? You shall say, By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So what is Passover? Uh, commemorating. What are you remembering? Well, God was strong and he brought us out. He rescued us. He redeemed us. He saved us from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and of animals. That's why I sacrificed to the Lord All the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of humanity I redeem. God doesn't ask for the sacrifice of children and humanity and image bearers. He asks for the dedication of them, that they would be dedicated and consecrated to the Lord. But the animals that first opened the womb, they are sacrificed unto the Lord. It's almost like um, a, a a thankful, an act of gratitude, right? Thank you, God, for rescuing us. So so that's how Passover... um, involves this firstborn, this womb, this children, okay, salvation, redemption. Now let's think about in John chapter 3, Jesus says, unless you're born again, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, well, when it comes to the Passover and this this event that takes place involving the Exodus where they go through the Red Sea, that that sequence of events uh, involves a type of rebirth and it involves actual water fascinating. Exodus chapter 14, 19 through 30, the angel of God was going before the host of the people. There's the cloud and darkness. It lit up the night. So this is still nighttime, uh, likely a different day. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. Now, what did Jesus say when he's trying to explain Ah, the born again process and, and being reborn by the spirit. It's like the wind, like you feel the effects of it. And you know that you're hearing or experiencing the wind because of your experience with it. So you know the wind's effects on you and the world around you. Well, here we have God blowing an east wind all night, making the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. A lot of people, and I'm just trying to like be as biblically accurate and sound as we can in our hermeneutic, which is the way you come to conclude things about scripture, your methodology to reading and interpreting scripture. A lot of people would like to say that based on Peter's writing, based on uh, some passages Paul will give, and based on the Exodus story, that Israel actually is experiencing water baptism. And I'm just saying, Israel doesn't get wet. (laughs) Like, if you want to make this about water baptism, yeah, water becomes a symbol and a shadow and a type to represent what Jesus brings us into and through. And these waters are not just to foreshadow and and symbolize uh, death. And, and, and going through the waters, it, there's a lot of different things these waters will represent throughout the scripture. So I don't believe that we can conclude Jesus is referencing the Passover, where that's the setting. Therefore, when he says you must be born of water, he's talking about water baptism. I know I said I wouldn't make this about water baptism, but I just want to touch on that assumption people bring to the text. This is them passing through, and it is a, the word baptized means to be immersed in, Okay. That water does not have to be involved when we use the word baptizo in the Greek or whatever word is translated in the Hebrew baptize, right? You're just immersed in something. You can be baptized in fire. You can be baptized in water. You can be baptized in the spirit. You can be baptized in Jesus's death. You can be baptized in judgment. You can be, there's all these different things you can be immersed into. So Israel here passing through the Red Sea, uh, Egyptians follow them. We know how this, how this ends. God tells Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, and the waters come crashing back down on the Egyptians, right? And then this is how it ends. The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. 
But notice it's right here. I forgot to read this. My fault. I skipped a little bit. Um, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. This is an all-night event. You ever had a youth group all-nighter? Well, this would be the worst kind if you're an Egyptian. Youth group all-nighters already suck. <laughs> Imagine being Egyptians in the middle of the Red Sea at your last all-nighter. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that followed them. Not one of them remained. But here's the distinction God is making between his people and, and Egypt. Once and for all, the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. Waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. So there we have water being involved in what will be later referred to as a rebirth. Israel technically becomes a national entity, I would say, at this point. They have officially crossed over through what crushed their enemies. They were preserved. They survived. Just like Noah comes through the flood waters in the ark to a new world on the other side, we have that same thing happening with Israel here. In other words, just as we're to see Noah as coming into a new world, you might say a kind of God washes and cleanses the world. It's a kind of rebirth metaphorically speaking, that same thing is happening here with Israel, okay? And that same thing can be seen with Moses coming through the waters of the Nile being preserved. But 1 Corinthians 10, just, just so we're clear on what the New Testament will say about this event. Paul will say, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. Our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses. All were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and the sea. Meaning, whatever baptism is being referenced here, it is not just about the water. It's actually also about the cloud, which you might say can be representative of the wind. I wouldn't go that far, but if you'd like to, that makes a lot of sense because we're going to see a lot of examples where the Spirit of God is related to water and wind. But either way, the point here is there is a kind of baptism that they're undergoing. It is not necessarily water baptism per se, but water is involved. It, water, you might say, is the, the, the thing they go through to the other side. Um, but I don't believe that it's proper to conclude that therefore it is water baptism. Water is just, um, you could say, is the setting or the tool God uses or the means by which God brings them to the other side. But the real uh, amazing thing is, is, is the God behind all of that. Um, ex Ezekiel chapter 16. Let me show you what I mean. Again, technically, Israel is reborn, becomes a national entity. You might say they are birthed. Uh, through the waters, through going through the waters of the Red Sea, they become what God will refer to as the firstborn. He will tell Pharaoh, let my firstborn go or I'm going to kill your firstborn. Okay, that, those are, the, those are the, um, the conditions of this game. If you want your firstborn, let my firstborn go. So God will re refer to Israel as his firstborn. Very important to understand that. And they go through the waters. It's a kind of birth. They are, they become that national entity unto God as his unique covenant people, which will involve Mount Sinai. But I digress. Ezekiel 16 says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Now look at what Ezekiel, uh, God tells Ezekiel, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say this, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites, right? That's where you come from. Your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite, referring to Abraham and his lineage. And as for your birth, or his uh, father's, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. Look at the intense imagery God uses to say, Israel, when you um, came out of Ur, or out of Haran, in the loins of Abram, ain't nobody cared about you. You technically, in the eyes of the world, were nothing. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion. You were cast out on the open field. You were abhorred on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you, I saw you wallowing in your blood. Now watch. And the Lord said to you, in your blood, live. 
Ezekiel is the same prophet that will have the vision of the dry bones. Remember? And God will say, can I make these bones live? And Ezekiel will say, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's like, Ezekiel, do you? <laughs> you know, God. Yes, I, I think, right? And then God makes them live. And then the breath is given. I think that is to be correlated to this right here. God telling Israel as a national entity, live, live. I said to you in your blood, live. I made you flourish like a plant. You grew up, your hair grew and all this stuff. You were naked and bare. So in other words, she needs to be covered, this metaphorical woman. When I passed by you again, I saw you and you were at the age for love. Okay, and I, I think this right here is going to be the Exodus story. This right here is God going, okay, now it's time to act. Now it's time to rescue my people. Now it's time to bring them through and judge their enemies. When he passed by them again, I saw you. You were at the age for love and I spread the corner of my garment over you and I covered your nakedness, a reference to Genesis 3. And the Lord says, I made my vow to you. I entered into a covenant with you. Right? This is what Sinai is, 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 um, is doing, the whole situation there. And you became mine. Right? So God is referencing that event at the Passover, the Exodus, and then Sinai, those sequence of events where they become his people. They're in that sense born a national entity under the people of, as the people of God to be his. Then I bathed you with water and I washed off your blood from you. I anointed you with oil. Two of the most common images used to represent the spirit throughout the scriptures are going to be water and oil. Okay, water and oil. And then the blood here is involved as well. So there's the spirit, there's the water, and there's the blood, you might say. First John speaks of that trifecta. I clothed you also uh, with embroidered cloth. I shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen. I covered you. So this has got adorning and covering and, 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 and beautifying and protecting and bringing this uh, metaphorical woman, which is Israel, under his wing to care for her. In your renown went forth among the nations. So, so that's essentially, you might say, the origin or the birth story of the nation of Israel, right? So the people of Israel become the firstborn of God, the national entity, by going, not just enduring Passover, but going through the Red Sea, being born of water in that sense, to imitate the human birth that happens through water. And then the covenant takes place at Sinai. Now, if you go back to John 3, there's all, that's all background information. Because I understand that not everyone has the same uh, level of understanding about Passover. So as a teacher, I must make sure we are on the same page and we're using the same terms. And we're defining these terms the same. Because now when we get to John 3, the last uh, verse in our specific passage we're going to look at today is referencing the bronze serpent. The bronze serpent. So we know Passover. We know the significance of the firstborn and the womb and, and the water and this being born a national entity and, and becoming the people of God and the firstborn of God. We know how all that fits into Passover. The question now becomes, what about the bronze serpent story in Numbers 20 or Numbers 21? What, what about that? Do we see any of those components in that story? And here's what I would like to say about um, the bronze serpent story. The whole point of this story is to say, look, even though you are God's national entity, covenant people, you still need to be saved from death and sin. In other words, these uh, national Israelites were still capable of sinning, rebelling against God, and eventually falling in the wilderness, not seeing the promised land and not entering in, which is going to be referenced later in Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews will say, they never knew my ways. They never, all this stuff, okay? So watch. Watch, watch, watch. I know we have a lot of presuppositions about water baptism and, and thoughts to say about that. Notice how... John 3, it, that's just not a part of the conversation because John, uh, the, the new covenant baptiz water baptism that Jesus will later institute with his disciples, that is not yet existent at this point in his ministry. So Nicodemus would only know of the Jewish cleansings and washings and ritual, you know, uh, water being involved in those things and he would only know about probably John the Baptist like dipping people in the Jordan and what's this this is something kind of related to what we know and it's still kind of new so Nicodemus would not have that framework of a new covenant water baptism to 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 anything that we're talking about to like link it to that 
Um, but the bronze serpent story is so important, guys. Very important. Let me take you there. This is a fascinating story. It technically starts in, I think, hmm, should I split this in half? It might be helpful. No, you guys can track with what I'm doing. Y'all are smart enough. Right before the bronze serpent story takes place. They're journeying from Kadesh. They're coming to Mount Hor. Right? The Lord says to Moses and Aaron, hey, Aaron's about to die. Aaron goes up. Aaron is stripped of his garments. He, he dies, you might say, naked in that sense. Maybe not physically naked, but stripped of his uh, priestly status. And it's given to Eliezer, his son. He's gathered to his people. Aaron dies. They mourn for Aaron for 30 days, which means this is a big deal. After Moses and Eliezer come down, they're like, oh. Aaron's not coming back, is he? And now we have the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev. He heard Israel was coming by the way of Atharim. He fought against Israel, took some of them captive, and Israel vowed a vow to the Lord. And Israel said, look, if you will give this people into my hand, like help us destroy these Canaanite people, we will devote their cities to destruction. Okay, notice destruction, judgment also is looming here. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel, gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Horma. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea. So this is the first time, I think, at, at this point in the story, maybe, maybe not, I could be wrong, but if, I, if my suspicions... Why are you not working right now? Okay, whatever. I'll figure out that bug later. I think we're supposed to see. Whoa, hold on. Red Sea. I remember what happened at the Red Sea the last time it was brought into focus in the story. Well, they're setting about uh, out by the way of the Red Sea to go around Edom. Okay, Edom descends from Esau. That's his nation. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and Moses. Right, impatience, frustration, complaint, blaming. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die? I've highlighted all these different terms because they link us right back to the Passover Exodus story. For there's no food, there's no water. We we hate, we hate, we <laughs> we hate this manna so much. It is dry and crusty. It's making our mouths super. We hate it. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Please pray for us. Pray that God would take these serpents from us. Moses prayed. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. This is a bronze serpent. This takes time to make. This takes time to get the right people who can make it if Moses is not the one directly making it. He's telling Moses, but Moses might be distributing the work to professionals, experts of the trade. Like how many people are dying as this thing is being made? As, God, as, as, as the people are hammering this thing and melting the, the bronze and putting it together and now it's, now it's cooling and then they got it. How much time is passing and how many people are dying throughout this process? It just jumps from verse to verse for me. But if you watch the episode of The Chosen where they actually reference this story and, and Jesus talks to Nicodemus, I think they do a good job of, of really bringing in the, the kind of pressure and angst and fear and anxiety and stress that would have been uh, uh, surrounding Moses as he's doing this. And then the people, like Moses, we asked you to pray. Can you hurry up? Can you do something for us? God told me to do this. God told me to do this. Are you serious? An image? You got mad at us for making a golden calf. Now you're making, I'm just doing what the Lord says. How is that going to help us? I'm just doing what the Lord says. He said, if you look at it, it sh you shall live. But people are dying. I know, I know, I'm trying. You know, that would be the setting here. So Moses makes a bronze serpent, sets it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And that is what Jesus chooses to reference and compare himself to. He says, just like the bronze serpent was hung and people who were dying from the bite of the serpents were looking to that to be saved and they were trusting in God. Just like Moses trusted God enough to make it and do this crazy thing. So if you just look to me and trust in me, who Jesus, who's hung on the cross, you will live too. And you'll be spared from the bite of the serpent, which is sin and death. So this is a fascinating story. 
Let me show you how this overlaps with um, the Passover Exodus kind of Sinai narrative. I know those are different events, um, but at times throughout the Old Testament, they're kind of like shoved together as if to be just like, let's address that season of Israel's history. Um, in Exodus 13, 15, we have the death of the firstborn right before Israel is about to go through the Red Sea and, he, and, he, and Pharaoh's going to chase them. We have the death of the firstborn in Egypt. Well, right before this story, do you know who dies? Aaron. Do you know who Aaron is? Aaron is three years older than Moses, according to Exodus. He is the older of the two. He's the only other one besides Miriam that we have that is a relative of Mo brother Moses. So he would have to be the firstborn. We have the death of the firstborn here, right before this event transpires. And let me show you something else. Um, so here's the sequence of events. First, we have the death of the firstborn. Let's think about the Passover and Exodus. Now, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 28, we have Moses um, coming down a mountain with Eleazar, right? So think about when God met Moses at uh, Mount Horeb, which I've heard that where, oh, sorry, not Horeb, um, is it Horeb? It has to be. Now I'm looking silly. Come on, bro. Come on, search tool. Are you kidding me? Let's go Exodus 3. Moses and Midian. Horeb. Okay, cool. I'm not as dumb as I thought. So Moses, after talking to God, shepherding the flock in Midian, God meets him, right, on Mount Horeb. Moses comes down the mountain with Aaron to the people, right, and he tells them, eh, God's going to come rescue us. Well, now we have Moses coming down a mountain with Aaron's son to the people of Israel. And now we have the Canaanite king takes people captive. The Canaanite king fought against Israel and took some of them captive. What do we have with the Exodus story? We had people taken captive by Egypt, enslaved, abused, oppressed by the evil king, Pharaoh. And what does God do? God rescues them from Pharaoh, from slavery, sets them free, brings them into freedom. It's exactly what happens right here, right after the death of the firstborn. God gets victory over the enemy, his enemy armies that come against Israel. God wipes them out, right? Just like God wipes out Pharaoh and his armies after they let Israel go. And they're like, mm, you know what? I actually want to kill them. So Pharaoh takes his armies, goes out, gets destroyed by the waters. And here we have another destruction of a wicked king and his armies. And it's God who devotes them to destruction. And then we have in verse 4, after all these different events, the Red Sea is brought back into focus. The Red Sea is brought back into focus. In other words, pay very close attention and think the splitting of the Red Sea. Because what we're about to see is the water matters. And they're said to go around the land of Edom, right? Uh, when Let me just take you to the verse, actually, so you're not like, hmm, I, I doubt that. But in Exodus, here we go. Um, it says, when they left Egypt, God brought them around the land of the Philistines, right here. God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, right? Uh, <laughs> God led them around by the way of the Red Sea. So we have that same kind of thing happening right here in this story. Where he's like, you know what? Let's go around Edom by the way of the Red Sea. Are we about to experience something very similar to, yeah, I think so. And so in Numbers, it's Edom they're going around. In Exodus, it's the Philistines. Numbers 21.4, they get impatient on the way. Well, this is the exact same impatience we see at the Red Sea story. And when they're like, we want water, the waters are bitter, we want food, we want quail, there's this, we're, fat, we're just, we're done, we're done. We've reached our limit. God, get us what we want. Are you here or are you not? That same impatience is right here in this story as well. And notice this phrase right here. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? Where are they? They're out by the way of the Red Sea around Edom in the wilderness, going, oh, you brought us out here to die, didn't you, Moses? You jerk. Well, what we have right before they see the Red Sea split as they're standing in between Pharaoh and the Red Sea is this. Because there are no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Same thing. This is 
the that story just repeated and recycled. And you'll see this through the wilderness wanderings, especially with the golden calf incident. They grow impatient. They're like, you know what? We don't want to wait for Moses. He could be dead. He could have been transformed into some fair. We don't, we don't know. So let's just make a golden calf. Aaron? Aaron? Aaron's like, you know what? Yeah, let's just, uh, sure. Sure. If Moses is gone, sure. They're complaining about God killing them, just like we'll see in Exodus 15, 24, Exodus 16, 3. And then guess what? God brings judgment against the people for the rebellion, just like we see at Mount Sinai. When they build the golden calf, right? They build an image in opposition to God, in rebellion to God, and judgment comes. Well, interestingly enough, God reverses that scenario. Moses actually ends up crafting an image that God said to make. It's in the image of a serpent. The very thing, that, that must have been a sick joke to them at first. To, to make a bronze image that is the thing that's killing everyone. All right, everyone, look at that. Oh, look at the thing that's killing all of us? Sure. It, you're supposed to see this reversal. God is flipping the image on its head and going, you wanted to make your own image that brought death. And now you're out here in numbers in the wilderness and you're doing other things that are causing consequences. So let me flip this. Here's an image. It's a serpent. Instead of bringing death, it's going to bring life and save you because I've ordained it to be so. This is the, the way in which God wants people to be saved from the death that the um, serpents are inflicting, okay? Now, with all that background, I would go, yeah, there are a lot of correlations to the Exodus story. Uh, at least I think so. Here's what we can establish. And this is where we jump back into John 3. Um, this is, this will probably... Uh, blow your mind the way it did for me the similar elements in both stories are one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven things eleven things that i found in both the this bronze serpent story and the parting of the red sea we have salvation brought by god so hold on to salvation because all of these ideas it's exactly what you see in john chapter three for reals Salvation brought by God. The means of salvation is provided by God. At the Passover, it was the Passover lamb. Here in Numbers, it's the bronze serpent. Jesus will essentially, I'm not going to get to that yet. The third thing is we have helpless Israelites in both stories who continue going astray in their hearts and rebelling against God, complaining, making idols. The fourth thing is we have rebellious Israelites I already said that, sorry. Uh, the third thing was helpless Israelites that can't do anything to free themselves. The fourth thing was these rebellious Israelites continue going astray in their hearts. The fifth thing is there's a mediator. There's a mediator doing something to bring God's salvation. Whether Moses lifts his staff at the Red Sea uh, or gives them the instructions they need to like endure the, uh, the angel of death or whether Moses is the one making the serpent here in Numbers chapter 21, God has ordained Moses to be a kind of mediator to do something that benefits the people he represents. The sixth thing is God gets glory through what was hurting people by conquering it himself. Egypt was oppressing Israel. God gets glory over them by conquering them. The serpents here, or rather the, the enemy king right before this, took some of them captive, hurting them, or even the serpents. God gets victory over all of it. He gets glory in the midst of all of it. Um, in both stories, we have the death of the firstborn. Aaron, right before this one, and in Exodus, it's just the death of the firstborn in general. In both stories, we have the Red Sea water is, a, is present as a symbol. Okay, so are you tracking with it? We got water, firstborn, death of the firstborn. God gets glory. We have a mediator. We have Israelites. We have salvation. And then we have, in both stories, someone ascending a mountain and coming back down. Moses called by God, you know, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, he's at Horeb, which seems to be distinguished from Sinai in some sense, whether it's a peak. Or, it seems to be the same region and location. And then here, at this story, um, Moses has come down Mount Hor. And then there's some kind of backwards image in both. There's a bronze serpent here. And at Sinai, we're going to see the golden calf. But that's what people build. This is what God has people make when they obey him. And then in both stories, there's some kind of judgment from God. Okay? 
So just to like succinctly summarize, judgment, image, mountain, water, firstborn death, glory, mediator, Israelites, helpless and rebellious, and then salvation by God. Let's go to John chapter 3. And let's think about where and if we even see these ideas present in this text. Now, I'm not at all trying to force them in the text. I'm just saying, hey, if Jesus is going to reference two specific stories, or at least one of those stories is the setting of this conversation, and the other one Jesus directly references, then I got to see where they overlap. And I got to see if that's exactly what um, Jesus is talking about. So let's think about this. Salvation. Helpless, rebellious people, mediator, God gets glory, death of the firstborn, Red Sea, water present as a symbol, someone ascends a mountain, comes down, backwards image, and judgment. Well, in John chapter 3, right here at verse 15 and 16, everyone's favorite verse, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus is the salvation for humanity sent from God God's means of salvation is his son. Also, when it comes to the the whole Passover lamb at the Exodus story and the bronze serpent in the Numbers story, both were a means of salvation or an icon of the salvation, right? It was part of it. Jesus is actually the combination of the Passover lamb of God and the bronze serpent on the cross. He's both. He's both. The only reason he can be the bronze serpent to absorb our judgment, take our sin, and give us life is because he's the Passover lamb, blameless and pure and without spot. Third thing is Jesus comes to save the helpless Israelites first. He comes to his own first. John chapter 1. He came to his own and his own knew him not. He came to his own who couldn't free themselves from sin and death. Helpless, rebellious Israelites. Jesus is the mediator like Moses in both stories. He's, Jesus is the one who does something. He accomplishes the necessary work for our salvation. He represents us before the Father. God gets the glory through his son's triumph over sin. Just like we see um, Israel get victory over the Canaanite king or victory over Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They did nothing. Like in and of their, themselves and their efforts, they would not have achieved victory. They wouldn't have succeeded. God brings the victory. God gets glory. And through his son's sacrifice, sin, death, the powers of darkness are conquered. And then we have the firstborn in both, both stories. There's a death of the firstborn. Well, who is it that is the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, and the bronze serpent hung on the cross except the firstborn of God? God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that we might be saved. Who is Jesus calling himself and making himself out to be the firstborn, only begotten son of God to lay down his life. And firstborn refers to status, not necessarily uh, creation. Jesus brings the true living water. You think about the Red Sea in both stories and how the water is present in both settings. Well, Jesus is, he brings the true living water that is better than the Red Sea water. And he brings up better baptism of the Spirit than the baptism Israel went through at the Red Sea, right? Because Israel went through that and became a national entity. What Jesus brings us into is the living water. He tells the woman at the well in chapter 4. And then Romans 6 says we've been baptized into Christ. Jesus brings us through death to the other side into sonship. We become sons and daughters, children of God, born again by the Spirit. That's the baptism of the Spirit Jesus brings us into. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist already said, I baptize with water. He's going to baptize with the Spirit. John has already noted the, the strong difference between his water baptism and Jesus' spiritual baptism, which so far involves no water, to be very clear. The Red Sea narrative and the water surrounding that setting is symbolic of what Jesus brings us into and through. And in both stories, you have a man coming down a mountain, right? Jesus himself ascends. He's going to say it right here. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the true mountain of God, the true dwelling place of God in heaven, the true temple. Jesus is saying, I've come down from that to bring God's life. And then I must ascend back to him to to finalize the work I've done. 
Or what about the backwards image in both stories? You had the golden calf in the, at the Sinai narrative. You had the bronze serpent in the numbers narrative. Well, Jesus hanging on the cross is the backwards image like the bronze serpent. The serpent represented what inflicted death, what destroyed people, and sin is what destroys humanity. Which Romans chapter 8 tells us, Jesus took sin in himself. Sin took up residency in the flesh of Jesus to pay our debt, to absorb our judgment, so that we could be free and no longer condemned. This is exactly, let me take you to Romans 8. I feel like I'm supposed to take you to Romans 8. Because some of you might not believe me. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, couldn't do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh. Whose flesh? Jesus' body. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In every contrast between flesh, or, or, or uh, sorry, between heaven and earth, um, the world and God's kingdom, or spirit and flesh, the spirit of God is prominent in all of those contrasts. The, the emphasis is on God's spirit is present. That's what makes it better. That's why it's different. So thinking about the correlation between how God saves Israel from Pharaoh at the Red Sea or how he provides salvation in the Numbers story through the bronze serpent, in both cases, pay very close attention to this. Pay very close attention. In both cases, there is a serpent and there is a piece of wood. So thinking about what Moses does at the Red Sea, by lifting his staff, I'll get to this in a second, and the waters come crashing down on Pharaoh. And then the numbers story, the bronze serpent is present, the serpents are inflicting pain, the snakes are causing death. And then you have this bronze serpent presumably hung in a piece of wood because it's a, it's a pole, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily say wooden explicitly, but the only other poles referenced throughout Exodus are going to be the, they're all going to be wooden poles to hold the altar of incense or the bronze altar or the Ark of the Covenant or the table of showbread or the, all those things will be carried by uh, wooden poles that are now, you know, covered in gold or whatever. So I, I'm trying to draw your attention to the fact that there is a serpent and some kind of wood involved in both stories. The Numbers story with the bronze serpent and the Exodus story. So let's just look at Exodus. Not only does Pharaoh represent the serpent in his craftiness and his evil and his oppression of people, and in that sense, he is like the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. He is like a, a, an offspring of the serpent. Okay, But when Moses actually goes into Pharaoh for the first time, one of the signs that God does is turn the staff of Aaron into a serpent, and it consumes the snakes of the rebel magicians of Pharaoh. Then God tells Moses at the Red Sea to lift his staff over the waters to split them, and they come crashing in to destroy this serpent king Pharaoh, this one who is like the evil one Pharaoh. So the question becomes, could this be the very staff that turned into a serpent in front of Pharaoh? Because it says Aaron's staff when they're in front of Pharaoh, but at the Red Sea, it's Moses' staff. So throughout the story, God seems to interchangeably use the staff of Moses and the staff of Aaron for different things. So either they're both using the same staff at times, or they each have their own staff. But what we can say is this. When God called Moses at Mount Horeb, when he was a shepherd in Midian, God told Moses, throw your staff on the ground, and it became a serpent. So no matter what, both Moses and Aaron's staffs became um, associated with a serpent. Then we'll see the waters of Meribah uh, when they come out of the Red Sea and they grow thirsty and they approach these waters that are bitter, which means full of disease. God purifies the water by having Moses throw a piece of wood into the water and the wood purifies the water. The last key event to note is when they're fighting with the Amalekites. Uh, The Amalekites, while they're in the wilderness, attack the Israelites and those Amalekites descend from Ham. Um, who is a kind of serpent, and the Amalekites themselves represent the serpent in what they do to Israel. And God gives Israel victory over them by Moses holding up his staff, that piece of wood, and Aaron and Hur hold up Moses' arms. So in each of the stories, and then and the Numbers story, the bronze serpent is hung on a piece of wood. Um, in all of these stories, it is, it is fascinating to me that the means 
part of God's strategy for salvation, part of his method of bringing salvation involves some kind of wood. And there are several instances, uh, rather there are several events where the serpent and the wooden staff actually relate to salvation. So the staff of Moses thrown down to the ground in front of Pharaoh to bring physical salvation to Israel. Number one, the staff of Moses lifted to bring the waters down on the armies of Pharaoh to bring them physical salvation and freedom. The waters of Meribah, the wood is thrown in to purify and give them salvation so they're not dying from thirst. The fourth is the staff of Moses lifted up um, to give Israel victory over the Amalekites. Right, They're spared. And then here's something to consider. Moses was preserved in a basket. Pharaoh demanded that the Israelite boys be thrown into the Nile River. And Moses is preserved in a little basket, which brings us back to the Noah's Ark, which was made of gopher wood. Right, Noah's Ark preserved a remnant through the waters um, that cleansed the land, and Noah was brought through to the other side. Well, Moses went through his own kind of little ark as well. And now we have the bronze serpent in Numbers hung on a piece of wood, uh, likely because in the Exodus narrative, the only wooden poles referenced are gonna, or poles are going to be wooden. So the reason I say all of this is because that is, frankly, background information to what Jesus is saying here. That's all background. So when Jesus says, or rather, verse 1 and 2, when, when Nicodemus comes at night, you're supposed to think Passover, interesting, uh, ruler of the Jews, coming to Jesus, looking at signs he's doing, right? And he goes, God is definitely with you, man. <laughs> like, God is for sure with you. And Jesus goes, look, I know where this is going. Um, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, period. <sighs> That's interesting. I had, Nicodemus was at a loss for words, but this is what Hebrews 3 says. Who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Wasn't it all those who left Egypt led by Moses? Like, who was God provoked with for 40 years? Wasn't it those who sinned? You know, their bodies fell in the wilderness. To whom did God swear that they would not enter his rest? Those who were disobedient. So we see they were unable to enter the promised land or see the promised land because of unbelief. Now, some spies went in and they saw it, but they didn't get to experience it in a kind of living way where it's like, this is our home. They just got to, whoa, cool land. Then they brought back a bad report. The reason I bring this verse up is because Jesus is about to say, you can't see the kingdom of God. And then he'll say, you can't even enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. So here's what, I, here's what I'd like to propose. The promised land in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom of God. Heaven invading the earth, new creation, the new world, Jesus reigns, and God has cleansed the world of sin, death, and darkness once and for all. That kingdom that is coming once and for all, when it's fully realized, you cannot see or enter into that kingdom unless you're born again. Now, what does it mean to be born again? It means to be born of water and the Spirit. And Nicodemus goes, how can a man be born? My mama's, <laughs> she ain't here. How could I be born again? Also, I'm old and I'm not going back there. <laughs> how, can, how can a man be born a second time? Jesus goes, huh. so Nicodemus, there's two, there's two options with Nicodemus. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to give him some credit here. Either Nicodemus is tracking with the analogy Jesus is using which is the national birth of Israel at the Exodus. Like, you got to be born again. Israel was born once, like physically. They were born through their mother's womb. They came into the world. Mwah! But there was a second kind of birth they experienced as a national entity through the Exodus story. And he's gone. there's another birth that has to take place. And Nicodemus is probably tracking with that and wondering, well, how do we go back there and do it all again to do it right this time? Or Nicodemus is literally and rigidly saying, how can we be born again and go into our mother's womb? That's weird. Um, so there is no chance to go into your mother's womb again, but there is a chance to enter into the kingdom. So Nicodemus is talking about entering the womb. Jesus is talking about entering the kingdom here. 
there's a chance for Nicodemus to still do that. And Nicodemus, being a religious teacher, wants instruction on how to do this right. You're going to see this in, in kind of the way that you can either read this two ways. Either Nicodemus is totally tracking with what Jesus is saying. He's like, I see your analogy. Born of water, everyone's born through the water of a woman. And we're born in the, you know, we come into the world through that. And I'm going, how do we go back there? Or Nicodemus is just like, who, who, what, what are you talking about? Who, are we... Are we speaking the same language? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. If you want to reference all the different examples of water in John, John chapter 1, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. Um, He's supposed to be set forth, Jesus is set forth as a new Moses, bringing people, humanity, into a better baptism. Just like Moses led the people through the Red Sea, Jesus is going through the waters, but it's going to be primarily not just the waters that John the Baptist immerses him in, but the waters of death into new life, which is the resurrection. This is not about new covenant water baptism. If you make John chapter 1 about new covenant water baptism, you you miss it entirely. Um, Many Israelites didn't personally go through the Red Sea, but they were still baptized into Moses according to 1 Corinthians 10 because of their ethnic descent, because they descended from Abraham physically. So it's not about going, experiencing that event. It's like our nation went through that. That's fun. That's done. We all benefit from that. And in John 2, Jesus will turn water into wine. He'll turn water into something new. In John 4, there's a woman at the well, and Jesus will talk about living water. I'll give you living water if you ask. You can have uh, w- living water flowing in your hearts into the lives of others. John 5, 7, there's a man who's missing out on healing because he keeps, he's not able to get into the water that supposedly brings the healing. And Jesus goes, ah, you don't got to get in there. I'll bring it to you. John 7, 38, Jesus goes, look, if you believe living water will flow from you, come to me, I'll give you living water. In John 13, 5, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He cleanses Uh, Prior to that, he's already cleansed them through their faith in his word. Judas is present, but he's not cleansed. He's not washed. He doesn't believe. And then John 19.34, blood and water will, will, will come gushing out of the side of Jesus on the cross, which is like a new Moses Joshua going through a new Exodus baptism, right? All this stuff. And it ends with him as the bronze serpent on the cross, only to bring life in the end by going through death and into resurrection. So, The question we have to ask is, what does it mean to be born of water and spirit? Either these are two separate events, being born of the spirit is different from being born of water, um, or they are one and the same thing, like the spiritual baptism involves water. I would like to hold to the first, that being born of water is different than being born of the spirit. Now, before you import all your New Testament water baptism theology, I would just like to say this first before I explain. Being born of water, very simply, means to be born of woman. And I know people have trouble like, why would Jesus tell Nicodemus you need to be born a human when he's already a human? That seems unnecessary. That seems redundant. That seems unhelpful. That seems repetitive. Hey, Nicodemus, you need to be born of water into this world as a human and then born of the Spirit. Well, Nicodemus already did that. He's here. So why are we telling him to be born of water? I understand people's pushback to that conclusion. But it actually makes a lot of sense considering the womb, considering what Jesus is going to say essentially about their ethnicity as a Jewish nation. Being born of water in its most general basic sense is to be born of woman, to be born an image bearer of God. And I think what Jesus is hinting at is actually, actually, you need, that people have questions about like, well, did, can, can the devil be forgiven? Can fallen angels be forgiven? And it doesn't seem to be like that's even possible. Because Jesus doesn't take on the form of those guys. He comes into our world to take on our form. Image bearers of God are offered salvation. People who are born through, through water and, and, and are knitted in someone's womb and come into the world through that, they're image bearers of God. They're humans. They're offered salvation. you got to be a human. And I know that seems weird for us looking back at this and going, Ugh. 
but there's such a cultural gap between us and the way that they probably understood the spiritual and the supernatural. So I'll say this. There are a bunch of passages we can look at real fast to note that, yes, okay, the work of the Spirit is commonly represented with water throughout the Bible. Uh, the spiritual baptism into Jesus by the Spirit, right? So the spiritual baptism into his life, his death, his resurrection by the Spirit, the rebirth, that is represented by the metaphor of water. And I'm not going to overlook that. Ezekiel 36, God talks about the new covenant. Read it for yourselves, verse 25 through 27. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Is that literal water? And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. Is that physical, bodily uncleanness? And from all your idols. Oh, okay. I see. So this is a spiritual washing and inward cleansing. Ah. And I will give you a new heart. So this is internal. This is not physical. This is not material. This is a new heart, a new spirit that God puts within you that involves cleansing, washing with clean water. Then God says, I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and all these beautiful promises, right? That's the new birth. That's the regeneration. That's the spiritual baptism that is referenced in Ephesians 4, which, by the way, says there's only one baptism. Ephesians 5.26, and this is not at all to minimize water baptism or say don't do it. This is to say John 3 ain't talking about that. It's not. Ephesians 5.26, here's the work of the spirit associated with water Uh, as a metaphor for it. Uh, Jesus gave himself up for his bride that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water. And you're like, water baptism. No, fam, with the word. So she's clean and holy and inwardly, spiritually baptized and cleansed, not by water, by the word. That's what John 15 says. You are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. That's what he says to his disciples. Titus 3.3 3, uh, or 4. When the goodness and loving kindness, uh, 5, sorry, uh, of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual work whom he poured out on us. So what is the water being poured out on the people of God? The water, metaphorically and symbolically speaking, is the Spirit. The Spirit of God is very, the two most common images to refer to God's Spirit in Scripture is water and wind, or oil, oil, sorry. And then wind is a part of that. Hebrews 10.22, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What is it that is cleansing? Using the temple imagery they would have been familiar with, using the example of the high priest washing and putting the blood on the altar and, and all the, high, the, the temple language throughout the book of Hebrews, this is talking about the greater cleansing brought about by Jesus in his spirit. So I will admit to you that there are passages that associate the work of the Spirit, or rather represent the work of the Spirit, with water. But it seems pretty clear, and you go, I don't think this is born of water and the Spirit as separate things. I don't think the born of water here is referring to a a natural human birth. Well, look at the next verse. He uses the same two categories. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So look at the two clear categories that Jesus is using the physical born of water born of the flesh being flesh and the spirit the spirit born of the spirit this is John chapter 1 this is John and we'll get to that in a second okay I'm getting ahead of myself but we missed the part where it says you can't enter the kingdom of God you cannot unless you're born of water and the spirit it doesn't seem as though God offers Uh, redemption, salvation, or entrance into his kingdom to anyone except humans, image bearers of God, who are born of water 
and experience that physical birth, which is going to be um, likened to a spiritual birth. I don't know why we overcomplicate this, uh, but he gives us the two clear categories. And just to give you a few passages about entering the kingdom, Matthew, you'll see this language all throughout his gospel, entering the kingdom. Weirdly enough, in John 3, that is the only place in John's entire gospel where you will see the phrase entering God's kingdom. I want to say that again. You will not see that phrase anywhere else in John's gospel. You'll see it a lot all over the synoptic gospels and primarily Matthew. Um, so Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness exceeds that. So I just want, I'm, the only reason I correlate these passages is because if we boil down entering the kingdom to just be born of water and be born of spirit, then we miss these other dimensions. In other words, um, I'm not saying believing isn't enough. What I am saying is Jesus will make similar statements in Matthew's gospel and explain it with different words and use different language. So for instance, he says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes, you won't enter the kingdom. And you're like, oh, I got to be very righteous. No, someone has to make you righteous through faith. Matthew 7, 21, uh, there will be many that will say, Lord, Lord, uh, look at all the stuff we did. And Jesus will say, mm, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom. Matthew 18, 3, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to humble yourself to become like a child and receive the free gift in faith and admit your helplessness and dependence and, and, and need for someone to reach down into your brokenness and your death and pull you out of that. Matthew 19, 23, Jesus said, Oh man, it is difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Right? So there's this difficulty. There's this unless you, you won't. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You don't go in and you keep people from going in. So there's all that language surrounding entering the kingdom in Matthew's gospel. And now, to get to the born of flesh part, um, we are going to read John chapter uh, 3 verse 6 um, in just a sec. Real quick, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you at AboveReproachMinistry.com. Go to the website or click the links in the description below to check out all of our free Bible study resources. We have online Bible classes, devotional studies, Bible study workshops, all of my sermon notes, and more. You can even join our online church community on the Discord app. We also have discussion groups all around the world, and if you don't see one in your area, message me, and we'll help you start a launch group. I personally lead a group in Spartanburg, South Carolina. If you live in the area, we'd love to have you join us on Fridays for Bible study. So contact me if you're interested and if you or your church would like me to come preach or teach, just message me or shoot me an email and we'll see what we can do because I love preaching in person. If you're a new follower of Jesus, click the new believer section to access everything we recommend for new believers. And be sure to snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, to support this ministry. All right, that's all I got for you. Let's jump back into the video. John 3, 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I would like to correlate this to 1 Corinthians 15. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. So I, I just want us to be thinking about this, okay? The same two categories Jesus uses, flesh, spirit, physical, material, immaterial, heavenly, right? Of the earth, of heaven. The same two categories Paul's working with in 1 Corinthians 15. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 15, 15. Think about that. Flesh and blood can't. The spiritual kingdom of God is not compatible. Our flesh as it is, our physical makeup is not compatible with the spiritual kingdom of God. That's why we need to be given spiritual life. That's why our spiritual uh, selves, our spirits need to be raised to life. John 1 12 says to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, which is referring to what? Your ethnicity, where you come from, who you descend from, it has nothing to do with your physical material makeup, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
There's all this talk about becoming a child of God, which involves spiritual regeneration. We need to be given someone else's sonship, someone's status before the Father. And that's exactly where the firstborn uh, title for Jesus comes into play. For him to be the firstborn is very, very important for our regeneration. John 6, 62 through 64 says, um, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And the reason they don't believe is because they are of the earth and they're thinking in worldly ways and according to the flesh. So apparently there is a contrast between flesh and spirit, heaven and earth, all throughout John's gospel. It's as if Jesus is saying to the to Nicodemus in John 3. He's saying, hey, let's take a let's take a, a few uh, let's go back in history for a little bit. Remember the Passover? Remember the Exodus? Remember them coming through water? They were born a national entity through that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remember how Pharaoh was destroyed? Yeah, all that stuff. All that stuff is loaded within the setting and the references that Jesus is making. It's as if Jesus is saying, yeah, you can't rely, Nicodemus. You can't rely on your ethnicity or your national heritage to get you into the kingdom. Many Israelites personally went through the Red Sea with Moses and they still died in the wilderness. They still didn't see the promised land. They still didn't enter in. You can't rely on those past events or any physical metric like race, ethnicity, heritage, nationality. Everyone, Jew, Gentile, everyone has to be born again. So Nicodemus, I know you're holding tightly to your national heritage. I know you're holding tightly to the fact that you can't, you come from Abraham and you're not, yet that's your physical descent and you're the people of God nationally. You cannot rely on that to get you into the kingdom. Everyone has to be born again because everyone lacks spiritual life without Jesus. You won't see the kingdom. Whether you're Israelite or Gentile, it doesn't matter. You have to be born again. Because that which is born of the flesh, whether you're Israelite or not, it's of the flesh. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. I love that part of this conversation is you guys technically were born of water twice. Like you Israelites, you were technically the national birth and then your physical birth through your mama. That's not enough. It's not enough. You can't rely on that. It's as if when Jesus references the wind, we got to ask this and then we're getting close to closing. Close to closing. Why does he reference the wind? This is not just a Jesus is like, hmm, wind. There's a reason he references wind, and I think it correlates again to the Passover and that numbers narrative. Um, I'll say this. There is a mystery. There's a mystery that cannot be explained to the born-again process, to this regeneration of the Spirit, to spiritual baptism. You can't intellectualize it. You can't map it out on paper. Uh, the religious elite, like Nicodemus, they want hard facts. They want systems mapped out logically. They want to be able to make sense of every detail of the process, but the spiritual rebirth process can't be outlined in some perfect linear system. So what Jesus does is he, 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 he leans into the mystery and doesn't explain it, but goes, the mystery is like wind. It blows where it wishes. You hear it sound, right? And Nicodemus is like, yes, yes. But you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. Nicodemus is like, dang, thought you were going to explain it, bro. Throughout the Bible, there are two primary images, again, associated with the Spirit, and that is water and oil, but there's also wind. Uh, the breath, wind of God, um, the, the water, they're, they're key images of the Spirit. Two examples, for instance, Spirit, wind, and breath are the same word in Hebrew, ruach, um, the same root letters. Uh, God blows a wind over the waters to subside them. Remember the flood waters that came crashing in uh, during Noah's day? Well, God blows a wind over the waters to subside them. And then in the Genesis 1 story, when God's creating the world, we have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Um, in, in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, um, there's a sound like a rushing wind, and the Spirit of God fills the people of God. And then in Acts chapter 8, Philip is taken away by the Spirit. It's like he's zipped away like the wind here. Where do you go? How do you get there? Where'd that come from? It's the Spirit. So in the Exodus narrative specifically, 
just looking at Passover, um, the references to wind are this. The only references to wind are Exodus 10, 13, 10, 19, uh, 14, 21, and 15, 10. Uh, so Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night, and it brought locust. Okay? Then in verse 19, the Lord turned the wind into a strong west wind and lifted the locusts, drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. Right? So it's this idea of God just, where'd the locusts come from? God brought them. Where'd they go? God took them away. Exodus 15, 10. Um, or 14, 21, rather. Uh, Moses stretches out his hand over the Red Sea, and the Lord drove the sea by a strong east wind all night. The waters were divided. Where'd the wind come from? How, how'd he do that? He just did. Exodus 15, 10. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like lead. Awesome. Well, in Numbers 11, there's a wind that springs up and God brings quail from the sea and let them fall beside the camp. What's fascinating to me is in all of these references, uh, Numbers 11 is food. Numbers 15, it's to crush the Egyptians. Number four, numbers 14, crush the Egyptians, but also open the way for the Israelites. Uh, numbers 10, 19, it's the locust being driven to the Red Sea. In all of these different references to the wind, there is a reference to water as well, right next to it. It's like they're being paired together. Wind and water, as if to be representative of the work of God's Spirit. At that point, it's the work of God's Spirit in and among the Egyptians, but in John 3, it's the work of the Spirit in his people, internally. This is probably why we have this story in John, um, where Jesus will end up walking on water in John 6, and we actually see both these images of wind and water under the authority of Jesus. And then John 14 will tell us Jesus sends his Spirit. He's the one who gives the Spirit without measure. So it's as if Jesus is the one who is in authority to dispense his spirit, which is symbolized by water and wind. He gives his spirit without measure. That's the mystery behind it. How does he do it? How does it happen? How does it come together? All these beautiful things. And then we go back to John 3. What are we on? Verse 10. Um, So it is with everyone born of the spirit. There's a mystery to it. Nicodemus goes, how can these things be? Maybe he's not wondering how they're possible, but how, how does this make sense to the human brain? And we all want to like map out and make sense of how God does everything he does. We want it to make sense. Give me a linear bullet point list of how you did that, God. Explain it. Explain the mystery. And there is part of following Jesus is leaning into the mystery because you trust the one who's over it. And you don't need to have it make sense to you. Yes, we should ask and seek and want to know. But at the end of the day, there's a lot that we'll just have to chalk up to. It's, it is a mystery. Are you the teacher of Israel? You don't understand these things? Listen, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we've seen. But you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things. So here's another uh, example of... Jesus using these same two categories in this passage. Spirit, flesh, physical, spiritual. Here, heavenly, worldly, or earthly. If I've told you earthly things of the flesh, physical, and you don't believe, how can you believe in heavenly things? Now, verse 13 seems like a a random statement. No one's ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. Hello, I'm the son of man. I don't know... (laughs) This seems like a random statement that has no place here. But I believe Jesus is using this image to explain what the born-again process is like. This is not disconnected from him explaining the mystery of the born-again process. He's just using another analogy. The whole process of Jesus coming and then coming into our world and then going back to the Father, that is similar to our born-again process. Jesus came down, went into the grave, right? We also must die to our old selves with him and go into the grave with him. Jesus ascends, breaks out of the grave into resurrection life and ascends back to the Father. And so we are raised with him when we believe. We are raised to life from death with him. And this whole conversation has everything to do with spiritual 
baptism, which you will see explained in passages like Galatians 3, 25 through 29. But now that faith has come, and in, in each of these examples, sonship is at the, is at the focus of it, is at the center of it, sonship, adoption, being children of God, being in his family. Galatians 3.25, now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. In Christ, you're all sons of God through faith. Woo! Whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. Physical heritage, national descent, doesn't matter. National uh, identity, doesn't matter. Anyone can come into the kingdom. For as many of you, this seems like a very similar conversation Jesus is having with Nicodemus, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor... You're all Christ's. You're all Abraham's offsprings according to... Offspring according to promise. You are heirs. That's what Jesus is getting at, man. That's what he's trying to get Nicodemus to understand. What I'm coming to do is not a bronze serpent just for Israel, but it's life, death, and resurrection for all people. And you can let go of any identity and value you found in passing through the Red Sea at the Exodus. You can can let go of any identity and value you have found in your physical heritage and and national... You can let go of all that. Your identity and value is in none of that. It won't do you any good when you stand before the Father. Romans 6, 3-4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried. Did you physically get buried? No. So why do we make this about physical water? Not to minimize water baptism, but to say that in all these texts that we want to make about water baptism, it's just not right to try and force that into the text. We were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And I'm not trying to disassociate that from water baptism and say, water baptism does fit into the framework of our faith, but you need to understand where in the process it fits. And so now we go back to John 3 and we're ending on the the bronze serpent. So, That's spiritual baptism. And and Jesus goes, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And Nicodemus is probably going, he's not. He will not. There's no way. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. He Dang, he did it. He just compared himself to the bronze serpent. Nicodemus would know exactly what Jesus is saying here. That whoever believes in him might have eternal life. This is the whole point. It ain't just for Israel. It ain't just for you who passed through the Red Sea and had some special experience and and you descend from Abraham. It's not just for a physical people. It's for anyone who is born of woman. Well, who's that? Anyone who's an image bearer, anyone who's alive as a human. If you're a human, you're an image bearer of God, life is offered to you. So the whole point is this. Just because you were a physical descendant of Abraham didn't mean you escape the consequences of sin. It doesn't mean you get to avoid death. Being an Israelite didn't save you from judgment. When the serpents are biting the Israelites, being a descendant of Abraham did nothing for them in that moment. They couldn't go, ah, we passed through the Red Sea, we're the people of God, ow, ow, nope, didn't hurt. I walked through the Red Sea. That did nothing for them. What did something for them in that moment was looking to Jesus. We have overcomplicated this passage so much. And yet it is so very simple. My my three-year-old can understand. Trust in Jesus. Believe in him. Look to him. Rely on him. Lean the weight of your soul and your life and existence on what he's done. So in the same way, all people need to be spiritually born again to be children of God. This is all about sonship. How do we become children? The whole point of what Jesus is saying is you ain't children of God because you passed through the Red Sea. That firstborn national status, it does you no good when you stand before the Father. So here's what I'd like to end with. If we think about how the serpent in Numbers 
was lifted up on a pole, presumably a wooden pole because that makes the most sense, even though the serpent itself was made of bronze, which, by the way, bronze usually symbolizes judgment. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the same root letters for bronze are used, um, Nahash are used uh, in serpent. They come from the same two, same root letters in the Hebrew. So there might be a play on those words when we see Goliath covered in bronze. But either way, Jesus being lifted up here, if we think about how in Exodus, there were wooden poles used to carry the table of showbread. So the tabernacle, the place of God, was mobile. You had to be mobile because the people were nomads. They were wandering. So the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the bronze altar, the Ark of the Covenant, um, these items would be held up and carried by wooden poles that were covered in gold or bronze for the bronze altar. And the priests would actually carry these holy items in order to continue spiritual service to God wherever they would go. And that would, be, that would benefit the, the nation of Israel so that God could dwell in their midst as their king and be in covenant with them. All of that involved what was done in the tabernacle by the priests. So the covenant involved what they would carry around in the wilderness. I want you to think about this. The covenant God made, the relationship that he had with his people, it involved what they carried around on presumably their shoulders. Um, and if we think about how Jesus carries the cross, or Isaac carries the wood up Mount Moriah as Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, though he never goes through with it. If we think about how the priests carry the ark on the wooden poles overlaid with gold and the table on his poles, and if we think about how the bronze serpent is, is lifted up on a pole, there, um, Jesus carries our cross. He carries our sin. He mediates our covenant. Um, he carries the very testimony on his very back to usher in the new covenant and the greater temple, which means Jesus, in a perfect sense, in a better sense, has dealt with our sin and our death the way that the bronze serpent never could. This is all pointing to faith. This is all pointing to simple trust. What do you trust in? Do you trust in your knowledge of God's word? Do you trust in your physical heritage? Do you trust in your parents were Christian and you're good and you went to church and you were in you? What do you trust in? At the end of the day, when you stand before God, what is it that gives you a sense of security that, yes, I'm good when I stand before him? What is it that you draw a sense of value from? What do you allow to give you a sense of self-worth? Where does your identity lie? That, that, is, that is underneath all of what Jesus is saying. That the more you look to the Son, the more identity and value and self-worth you find in what he's done for you. Rather than what you've done for him or what someone else has done for you, it's what he's done for you. This is all about faith. And somehow, we have twisted and perverted this passage to become about its faith plus water baptism. Or faith is expressed fully in water baptism. Or water baptism is when faith is finalized and expressed in its fullest sense. And we've somehow made this about what you do instead of about instead of about what he's done. The people in the wilderness had to believe and trust in what God said. They had to believe in what he'd provided. There was no, I'm dying, I'm not looking to a stupid bronze serpent. There's, look, I'm giving, if he said to do it, I'll give it a shot. Holy moly, I'm healed. Everyone needs to trust in Jesus. And I'd like to end with just a proposition, just a thought for you guys to consider. When you add anything to Jesus, you pervert the gospel and the beautiful reality of just enjoying rest. But here's a thought I'd like to leave you with. Is it possible that the serpent, the bronze serpent, has any significance for how God used something for one season, right? But that original purpose came to an end. Um, but the people of Israel wanted to continue in that and bring it with them into the promised land and eventually bow down to it and make it what God never intended. Because if you follow where the narrative goes with the bronze serpent, if my search works in um, Logos, for some reason it's been glitching. Okay. In 2 Kings 18 verse 4, 
it says that one of the kings removed the high places, broke the pillars, cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent Moses had made. Until those days, they made offerings to it. <laughs> what? So the bronze serpent slowly over time became what the golden calf was at Mount Sinai. It became something they trusted in rather than God. In other words, it replaced their trust and faith in God. When the bronze serpent was just to be an image of, I trust in God. I trust in God, so I'm going to trust in what he's provided. But that played its role for the season God gave it. And I wonder, because they brought it into the promised land, they bowed down to it, they made it into what God never intended it to be. And I just wonder, if Jesus is making all these comparisons, all these statements about his, how he connects to uh, Jewish history and, and the Hebrew scripture, is it possible that the bronze serpent represents the Mosaic law in its entirety? In that the Mosaic law played its role. It accomplished what it was supposed to do for a season. But then Jesus comes to fulfill the prophetic reality of not just the bronze serpent, but all of the Hebrew scriptures and the Mosaic law. Did God want them to leave the bronze serpent behind or take it? He definitely didn't want them bowing down to it. And if Jesus comes to do what the bronze serpent pointed to, if Jesus comes to do what the law pointed to, I am not at all saying that the bronze serpent is entirely and completely paralleled to the Mosaic law. I'm just wondering if it represents it in some way to say it is possible to trust in what God provided for a season and then you stay there and you never move on and you miss the reality of salvation that that thing was pointing to. And I think that's what a lot of Israelites do today. Just not just Hebrew people. The physical descendants of Abraham who don't trust in Jesus as Messiah. And what's funny is it in John 5 and 6, Jesus will say this and we're done. Okay. I know I've gone over. Not even that. You guys don't even know what time I'm supposed to hold myself to. But in John chapter 5. He says, don't think I've, I'll accuse you to the Father. Because if you think this is about judgment, bronze serpent, destroying Pharaoh with the exes, Jesus comes to, I didn't come to condemn. I came to offer salvation. Don't think I'll accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you, and it's Moses. On whom you have set your hope. And Jesus doesn't say that positively. If you believed Moses, which means they don't, then you would believe me. He wrote of me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? He says in another place, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life. These just bear witness about me. And yes, there's other purposes behind Torah. There's other purposes behind the Hebrew scriptures. But there is, I'm, I, all I'm saying is that the same way the Israelites treated the bronze serpent, which was an uh, an which was an image of salvation for a season, and it became something else later on. It morphed into something that God never wanted it to be. I wonder if people are doing that with God's word, God's law, the Mosaic law. As, as much as we want to exalt the word of God and say that we need to follow and obey and love him, is it possible, possible to get lost in and stop at what is supposed to be revealing the one behind it? revealing God behind his word. God reveals himself in the scriptures, in these stories. That's why we break this down. That's why for those of you that are like, why do we spend so much time? Because if you understand what he has done, if you understand what he's accomplished, if you understand what we now have, you will live different. So my job is just to com communicate the biblical data as best as I can and trust the spirit of God to just bring life in that thing. Breathe life in that thing. Breathe upon his word to bring transformation into your life and reveal himself to you in a deeper way that leaves you living differently. I can't, I can't motivate you to do that. I cannot prompt change in you. I say this is who Jesus is. This is how he's relating himself to the Old Testament. Look at all these images of salvation and, and Jesus being hung on a wooden cross so that we could live it's all about what he has done. You have to stop putting 
stock and hope and trust and value in what you can do for him. When it is all about what he does for us, and then I go and get to do things for him, but my identity is disconnected from that. My value is disconnected from that. My sense of eternal security is disconnected from that. It is all in the one who was hung upon the cross and died my death and raised to life so that I could live. That's it. It is that easy. It is that easy. That God has provided salvation to anyone and everyone and you can complain all day about what he has or hasn't done or what isn't. He has provided a way for you to come back into relationship with him. And it's through his son. There is no other way. It is simple trust in his faith. And that faith will be expressed in each of our lives in different ways, for sure. But it is simple faith. That's it. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts and your insights in the comments. If you want to share your thoughts and questions about these studies, join us every Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a live discussion together. And thank you for supporting this ministry. Your support helps us accomplish our mission, which is to teach people how to read the Bible so they can live and teach it for themselves. We're only able to make all of these free resources because of generous supporters like you. So thank you very much for all of your support. Make sure to visit AboveReproachMinistry.com to check out all of our free resources. And as always, keep moving towards Jesus.